the four big tours, Iraq, uh, three Afghanistan, nearly getting captured uh, or escaping a kidnapped attempt in Baghdad. Yeah, what was that one? What was that one? Have we got time for that? Yeah. So the first tour, Baghdad, amazing. My my first tour, what I've dreamed of. And not only that, I'm going out to do the pinnacle of UK forces operations. General routine was we'd go out at night and... That's okay, bro. A <laughs> routine there was we'd go out at night and kill a capture, kick doors in, get people out of their beds, bring them back high-level targets, not your pipe swingers, foot soldiers. During the day, we'd have a bit of downtime then, unless there was a daytime job. Sometimes there was. So myself and one of the paratroopers, Mark, he was a trauma medic. I was just the basic medical skills that any Marine would have. But we were muckers, traditional enemies, as the status quo goes with Marines and paras, but they're not. It's the same as anything. If, if you're Man United, you need a rival. Otherwise, you get fat and lazy. Same with the Marines and the paras. But we were good muckers. So in the day, we come up with this little scheme, plan, to go to the American hospital down in Baghdad and help out. Flirt with the nurses, use all their welfare facilities, the internet and uh, swimming pool, and enjoy that for a little bit. So each day we'd, because we weren't on a regular operation, we would dress in civilian clothing, sign out a civilian car from the motor pool, and then drive, make our own way down. There's an area in Baghdad called the Green Zone, and it's a protected area with all the contractors and civilians and stuff work in amongst the hell that is Baghdad. So we'd sign all this cut out, we'd take a pistol with us only, and we'd drive down to the hospital, go there, flip with the nurses, hang around for a bit, head back. There are only two routes back from the hospital back to our camp. So we couldn't really put much deception in for setting patterns. So this particular day, we'd left it a bit late, it was getting dark, which we always tried to avoid uh, before heading back. We'd set off. And we were driving towards uh, a roundabout. So as we were approaching, we could see up ahead, it was rush hour in Iraqi time. There was quite a bit of traffic. And up ahead by the roundabout, there was a commotion going on. So we're both sort of looking at it inquisitively. What's going on? As we're looking ahead of this commotion, we see a few guys who look armed. And they're not wearing uniforms. A lot of people armed in this green zone, civilian and military. There's no uniforms. We in a sort of black tracksuit, pyjama type uh, outfits with AK-47s. Right, this has got our attention now. As we're doing this, t- to our right was uh, as a line of woods. From the line of woods, a long guy just walks out, right in front of our car, turns around and just raises his AK-47 at, at the window screen. So we're like, boom, silence, you've you got our attention. Immediately in that car, as with anything in the military, you're trying to work out what is, what's going on here. I'm trying to assess it and what do I need to do about it. Two very different emotions getting played out in the front of this car. Marx was more hasty and urgent. Right, shit, we got to do something. We got to do it now. Whereas mine was the opposite, which was, well, hang on a minute. Let's not do something too hasty and make it worse and work out what is actually going on at the minute because we don't really know yet we got an idea so this has been played out and what i spoke about before is a lot of people will go through life and not find out something that certain thing about themselves or how they would react in a situation i'd never been in that situation before and i didn't know you like to think you'd know but my obviously natural reaction obviously was to not panic if you like or, or not just panic but just act to brashly marks was the opposite let's let's do something and the balance between the two as it turned out because i'm still sat here worked out to be the best option so mark gets the we're carrying a mobile phone and it's attached to our quick reaction force which is uh some of our guys and some of the sas guys back on camp who would come and react to any situation like this so mark gets phone out no signal great So at this point, I've got my pistol 
underneath, I'm sat on it. So it's pointing towards me, but underneath my ass. Loaded, but not made ready. So there's no chance of me shooting myself in the ass. Shooting your dick off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's <not that> big. <laughs> so immediately, <clears throat> I'm, pull, I'm getting that ready. So I pull it out, and <clears throat> this gunman has signaled himself to me now as the sprog. They've sent the most junior guy, which is their policy, because he's the most likely to get shot in this situation. They know we're carrying weapons. We've been targeted. So they're like, we'll send him, because if, if they do start shooting, he's going to catch it up first. So he hadn't asked us to put our hands up on the dashboard, which he should have done in that situation. Straight away, of course you do, because he, he's going to know we're armed. He hadn't. So I'm like, right, this is the sprog. We can, we can maybe leverage him a little bit here. So pistol out, cocked it down out uh, below the dash, out the view, just so that we were ready if we, we wanted to act. Mark's now saying, it's a snatch attempt, mate. I'm going to put my foot down, go through him, J-turn it then, and get out of here. And there's traffic all around us. So I was like, well, don't do that, Mark. Let's take a moment, because if you do do that, he's just going to open fire. At the minute, he's not firing. If he, w if he was there to execute us, he'd have done it by now, long ago. And, that, and we know that isn't their plan, because they, they kill American troops every day in Baghdad. They don't capture them every day. There's a lot more value in that for them than just shooting us dead. They could do that any day of the week. And then the conversation is, right, Mark, it's got to be a snatch. I said, like, yeah, it probably is. And then Mark goes, do you remember the intelligence brief from Mick, our sergeant, a few days ago? I was like, yeah, roughly. He said that the Al-Qaeda Iraq are planning to snatch a Westerner from the green zone between the 22nd and 24th of September. Today's the 23rd. So we're both like, fuck. Listening to that brief, just going, yeah, all right, they're going to snatch a hospital worker or something, not knowing that these guys have been watching us to, to get our movements over the last however long. And it's obvious, I thought about this afterwards, and people have asked me, how, how did they know who you were and where you were going to be? And each day we go into that hospital, you got to unload your pistol, for the because there's American troops there, but it's also private security guards, people from like India and the Middle East and um, Africa that they've paid peanuts for to come and be security. We've got no loyalties like the US troops have. So we'd unload our pistols every day and obviously you have to show some ID. And Mark says British Army, mine says Royal Navy. So clearly at this point, the information is going, there's two guys who turn up every day in an unmarked car in civilian clothes with pistols, longish hair, unshaven, One's got British Army ID, one's got Royal Navy ID. So that sets us apart to the normal security guards who are working out there. These guys are undercover or special agents or special forces or something like that. So now we know they're here for us. We, <clears throat> this is a kidnapped attempt. So the options are try and, try and drive through it, maybe try and bust our way out of it. So I start playing dumb. So I start going to the guy, I'll see your pistols back between... My legs facing the other way now, going, motioning that I, I don't understand him. And he starts coming towards us. So the options are now, well, I could do him through the side window. I got the pistol. We could do him. So I said to Mark, right, if I do him through the window, now you can J-turn it and get it out of here. Give us a bit of distance between the, the actual gunman on, on the roundabout. As he approaches, I decided not to do that. Again, let's, let's keep trying to weigh up the options. And he starts point, pointing towards the roundabout. So just drive forward. So I'm like, right, Mark, right, just, just do what he says for now and we'll keep weighing it up. Mark keeps pulling forward in the car towards the roundabout and it's four gunmen there now, with all with AKs. They're stopping the traffic, making sure there's a clear route for us. Up ahead, the, the right turn off the roundabout, because we're driving on the right-hand side of the road, is an exit checkpoint to the what they call the red zone, which is Greater Baghdad, wild west badlands so it's clear now that he wants us to go out of that exit because once we do we're anybody's snatch us and nobody's going to find you then mark's going it's the red zone i ain't going into the red zone i was like no me neither right do what he says for now i said once we get to that roundabout we'll pull off to the side we'll jump out get the pistols out and then maybe drop him and leg it into the woods 
or get out of here because we're not going out out of that checkpoint. And I don't really want to get any closer to the to the four guys with AK forty sevens. Do that, and as we pull off the roundabout, now stops the car. Mark and me both jump out. Mark comes around to my side of the vehicle with his pistol as well. Now, pistols out, drawn over the top of the vehicle towards this sprog who's watching us, and the look of like disbelief and shock on his face was brilliant because he was the cat was amongst the pigeons here. He was like, "This wasn't meant to happen." These two guys are meant to do what I said because I'm pointing a weapon at him. And here they are, they've jumped out and now we're pointing weapons at him. Standoff going off. The other guys are shouting at him from the roundabout. He's looking over his shoulder shot and he's getting a bit twitchy now. So I'm a bit concerned that he is going to start shooting because he's lost control of it now. We're not doing what he said. We're not contained in the car. So I say to Mark, right, we're going to drop him and we're going to leg it in, into the woods. At this point, again, he's, the guys on the roundabout have realised we ain't playing ball. They've then pulled over another car, which has uh, two women in it. Dragged them out, and they're um, American women. So I call over to them. Oh, they shout out, they're trying to get us to go out of the red zone. They're trying to get us out of the I said, don't go out of the red zone. We're British forces. Try and get back in the car. So they hadn't, they didn't have hands on them. They, he directed them, the, the sprog guy, for them to get out. So conversations they had, get back in the car, don't go, don't go out of the red zone. So I'm saying to Mark, well, we've got to act now because I'm a I'm a proud man, but two pistols against five AK 47s, I I'm pretty much sure we're gonna lose this firefight. As we're about to take action, up on the roundabout, it's another commotion. An American convoy has now approached it with their heavy machine guns on top. And the cheeky bastards have stopped them, these guys with the AKs. And the, the Americans aren't messing around. They're like, fuck you. Cock their .5 uh, caliber machine gun. And they're on the tannoy now. We are American forces. You are not authorized to stop us. Get the fuck out of the way. So I'm like, I had to bark now, right? We're not opening fire now. Because those Yanks aren't going to fuck about. If they see... Two guys, they don't know who we are. They just see two guys shooting from across from them when they're being held by an armed gunman. They're going to sh start shooting us, and we're definitely not going to win against against them. Yanks are now braced up against them, weapons pointed at them, and at this point, the terrorists are like, fuck, chance is gone. Drop their weapons and leg it through the, uh, through the, the red checkpoint out of the gate. Bizarre moment then. Because the security guard just stood and watched them. You've got Iraqi police and Iraqi army on this guard. Didn't do anything. So they're obviously in on it, corrupt, uh, and up to no good. And then it's just a surreal moment where me and Mark just sort of looked at each other. I'm like, best get back to camp then. And got back, got back in the car and drove back to back to the camp. 